Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this conversation on implementing performance-based instruction in an organization. My name is Colin Hahn, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Guy Wallace. If you're not familiar with him, you absolutely should be. He has been doing work in this space since 1979. The list of accolades he has just goes on and on. I'll just signal out that he received the Honorary Life Member Award from the International Society of Performance Improvement. He's widely recognized as one of the top people in this field. Um, he is incredibly generous with his knowledge, and uh, it's really fortunate that we've got the opportunity to have a conversation with him today. So, Guy, thanks so much for being willing to have this discussion. Thank God. I'm happy to be here. So, I wanted to talk about the process of actually moving into the direction of performance-based instructional design and uh, performance-based training and all these other delivery modalities. Uh, it's one thing to say, yeah, this sounds exciting. It's another to be the person in charge of bringing this to an organization, especially if it's a new way of thinking about you know, what the training function can do. And I know this is something that you've written about in places like your uh, resource Lean ISD, which is available for free on your website. Um, if you wanted to just kind of frame out what someone would do in this space and maybe just orient us to what this process might look like. You're in charge of a learning and development function. You want to move in the direction of really focusing on performance rather than just doing generic one size fits all training. What does that transition process look like? Well, this is kind of problematic because, you know, you need to be situational. You need to uh, understand you know, the dynamics of the current state, the situation that you have. So let's say that you have an organization of 30 people and I've got two. Well, that's very, very different. Um, and and it, and it depends on, you know, what the knowledge and skills are of the people that you already have or intend to bring on board, you know, because there's that as well. But so when I brought people into my own consulting firms and developed them, I made them instructional developers to start using whatever media that uh, the client, uh, that the design dictated, um, and they would develop that content um, in the three modes that I generally use, group-paced, coached, or self-paced instruction. And so they would start there and they would get designs and then have to build it out. And so they became familiar with the designs themselves, what they looked like, what they meant, what they said, what they didn't say, uh, where they were free to improvise and extend it because the designs were never that detailed that, you know, you were locked in and you couldn't, you know, uh, add your own creativity and insights and all that. Now, the developers worked with other master performers and other subject matter experts, et cetera, to build out the content. Um, but that's where I started people. And then I would have them do the design and learn how to do the design. And then I'd have them learn how to do the architectural design. And then after that, I would make them analysts. So that they, because they had seen the analysis data as they did the architectural design or the or the module or course or event or experience des, design and development. So once they became an analyst, they'd been kind of through, you know, all the really key skills, except for that one most important skill, which is being the project planner and manager, mm -hmm. which usually also went hand in hand with being the person doing the intake of the request, clarifying the request, uh, meeting with whoever else needed to be involved up front and decide, you know, what's the plan? You know, what are the key deliverables and what are the dates and, you know, what's this going to cost and what are you going to charge me? You know, those are the client uh, requests. So, you, so if I, so I start off with, you know, those five roles, um, the project planner and manager, the analyst, the curriculum architecture or instructional architecture designer, and then the experience designer, if you will. And then I would always, I had another special role called the lead developer because the things that I worked on were generally large scale efforts. And it would involve more than one developer so we could divide and conquer the design and work in parallel rather than in series to create all of the content and have it 
fit together so that we could pilot test it. So I had this special role of the lead developer whose job it was, was to take the design and corral all the resources, the instructional developers, the subject matter experts and master performers, um, and even oversee the pilot testing uh, so that we could do a full destructive test and figure out what's broken so we could fix it before we would do a general release to the world. Um, and so that lead developer was also key and critical. Um, and so if I'm thinking about those roles, those five roles, when I face a situation, if I was a client or if I'm consulting with a client about this, I, I would need to ask, so are you desirous of creating a bunch of specialists who wear one or more hats, but, or do you want a generalist that wears all five of those hats? Um, or do you want some combination, some mix of those, because you may have some people that can do it all and others who specialize in one thing or another. And that depends on your organization and what you see is your workload going forward, how you're going to interact with your clients, you know, how you, how much volume of business you may be doing in the first year might be very different in the second year and the third year, because once you have successfully demonstrated something, you're going to get more people coming to you asking for some of that for themselves. Um, at least that's been my experience with my clients, because uh, that's what often happened. I do the first curriculum architecture. Uh, they, my team or their team would build it out. And all of a sudden people go, well, this is different because this is focused on performance and not on topics or behaviors or knowledge or skills or competencies out of context, because good training, performance-based instruction is all those things in context. But uh, but so that's the key thing to start off is, am I going for specialists or generalists? Uh, and, and, how, and how soon quickly do I need to get them in place and be competent? Um, so in the Lean ISD book, and that book was written as a companion piece to a set of workshops that I had for project planners and managers, for the analyst, for the two levels of designer, and then for the developer, we didn't have any particular workshop for them. They would learn by being involved in projects. And then, you know, the baton, the big, heavy, huge baton would be handed to them. And they'd have to run off and go uh, get the resources organized and begin to, you know, develop all the content, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that Lean ISD book, what I wanted in it was... <clears throat> Uh, a sneaky trick here at the chapter 30, you know, after 29 other chapters about all of this, orienting people to, you know, what are these phases, what are these methodologies, what are the phases, what are the outputs, okay, at a very high level, then a deep dive into the various aspects of each one of those, mm -hmm. and then wrapping up the book, you know, what are the skills required of the practitioners, and then how would you go about doing and implementing this, and I have... Uh, five stages uh, in an implementation plan. And this is what I use basically at General Motors. This is what I, uh, I, I spent five years with General Motors in Detroit, Michigan, um, starting in 1995. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a funny story. In 93, they had me come and present to them about my methodologies because I'd heard about it from my business partner, the late Ray Svensson, who was doing strategic planning for their training organization. Uh, organization and employee effectiveness, I think was the group or something something along those lines. But anyway, one of the things that, that General Motors was about to undertake was a huge project called Bugum, Best Under General Motors, Bugum. And because the maintenance costs of all of their content, all of their instructional content or educational content for the most part, some of it training, some of it education, was killing them because across all of General Motors North America, at every location, people were creating content, training content. It would go into the, into the you know, the, before there was an LMS, there was the equivalent of that and it came out as course catalogs on paper. And they were the maintenance was killing them and they were investigating how do we reduce these maintenance costs because there's you know we got to think about things beyond first costs and life cycle costs so you create some stuff it goes out of date you got to maintain it well if you've got 27 versions of that 
that means you're going to maintain it 27 times when you could have created it once, maintained it over its life cycle one time each instead of all of these multitude of, of uh, overlapping and gapped uh, sets of content. Mm -hmm. And so that was killing them. So best under General Motors was intended to boil the ocean for the cup of tea as the quality movement people used to say back in the 70s and get down to a reasonable set of content and strip out all the redundancies that were not necessary. And so they did that. And then they decided, well, we've got to stop this from happening again, because if we don't do anything about it, we're going to be back in the same boat here needing to boil that ocean all around us. And they had me come in in 93 and present my methodologies. And whoa, boy, that was like overkill in the extreme guy. Thank you very much. And then I found out uh, later that they were going to go with DACUM, design a curriculum. It, it was uh, It came from the Ohio State University. I had investigated it when I was an employee at Motorola. I'd heard about it before then, but at Mo when I was at Motorola in 81, 82, I was asked to investigate that to see, you know, what promise did it have for us? Because otherwise we were going to have this guy named Gary Rumler create our Motorola instructional design process. And so what was what was there already that existed that we could uh, maybe borrow from and adopt and adapt from? Well, the funny thing about design a curriculum, this is no longer true, but back in those days, design a curriculum had nothing to do with design and was all about analysis. It, uh, it did analysis and, and created blocks of content that talked about major duties. Here's these major duties, like Addy is a bunch of major, major duties on analysis and design and then development and implementation and evaluation. So it would frame the performance using major duties. It would identify tasks. So the task analysis felt with it, fell within that. And then it identified skills. And that was it. That's as detailed as this framework got. And so people went out and used DACUM at General Motors and created a whole bunch of redundant content because you called a skill A, I called it a, V and the, you know, and so they ended up inadvertently creating a whole bunch of, of redundancies. And because they were so sensitive to the maintenance costs of these things, the people back at HQ headquarters in Detroit saw that that was happening. And they went, whoa, we got to stop this thing. And somebody, I don't know who, said, remember when Guy presented on this the year before? And we decided, whoa, this was overkill and extreme. I mean, he had 17 categories of knowledge and skills. I mean, you know, well, how ridiculous. And then they started looking at, well, what they were doing and what Guy had talked about. And they went back and looked at all the presentation handouts and all that stuff. And they decided, we need to have him come back and talk to us again. So they invited me again. My, my business partner was still working with other parts of the organization on various things and uh, <clears throat> to prioritize what the heck they were going to all be working on because it was t t a situation totally out of control. And Ray was working on the strategic planning saying, you know, what are the current state critical issues? What are the future state near-term and long-term critical issues? And how do we prepare our workforce to deal with all of that? Mm -hmm. You know, and General Motors was the world's largest manufacturing company at the time. And so it was a big deal and lots of money was involved. Um, but they had me come back in and, I, and uh, I did, you know, I think pretty much the same presentation. It was a long time ago, so I don't remember the specifics. But they decided that, okay, Guy has this process called Curriculum Architecture Design or CAD. And darn it, we use computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing tools, and we're not sure our people, our engineers, are smart enough to know that the difference. And I and so they go, okay, we're gonna have to, we're gonna, we want you to come in and do this stuff, but we're gonna have to change the names of everything. Mm -hmm. We won't necessarily change the configuration of data and the flow of the process of how data starts and gets uh, added to and and manipulated as you go through guy's process. But we're going to have to change the name of about everything. And I could not convince them that uh, my methodology was basically computer-aided design to do curriculum architecture design. 
because I was taking data and manipulating it much like computer. Anyway, so they didn't get it because, you know, they're in the training organization. And if I'd had a chance to go to their clients and at the top of the empire and explain how this was pretty much the same thing, I may not have had to go through the, all the rigmarole of changing everything mm -hmm. and formalizing everything for a technology transfer because we did things back in my organization and we knew what to do and how to do it, but we didn't have it all formalized and articulated so that we could train everybody because my approach to training was, you come with me, I'm going to explain to you what we're going to be doing in this next meeting, and I want you to take copious notes about this. I made people create a learning log, and I want you to write down everything that I tell you, and then when you're done, I'm going to look at it and see if I think you've got it right. Then we're going to go to the meeting, and I want you to take copious notes throughout that meeting, whether it was an analysis meeting, a design meeting, a, a project steering team gate review meeting, lots of meetings. And, and so this is what you're going to see. You know, Make sure you understand what you should be looking for. I'm going to tell you what I think might happen or where, where the forks in the roads are and what decisions they could be making. You take the copious notes through the meeting. Then after you're done with that, I want you to write down your reflections of what you saw compared to what I told you you should see and what you think you learned from all of that. And then you're going to come and sit with me and, and I'm going to read that and critique what you capture. And then maybe I'm going to have you co-do the next one of those with me. And then the time after that, I'm going to step back and let you go solo with me there in the background in the room, ready to step in and, you know, save the day, save the moment if necessary. Um, so, you know, fly, little bird, fly. And, and so that was my approach to developing my own staff. But And I had been doing training on the analysis efforts. Mm -hmm formal training. I've been doing this with uh, Amico and Eli Lilly and uh, then General Motors. I did it with Hewlett Packard. Um, so I was, you know, doing this with some big companies uh, because they had critical things and they'd seen me do the work and they decided, oh, you know, rather than have Guy and his team come in here all the time at their rates, why don't we train our own people on this? So I was more than willing to do that. And this goes back to the early 80s when I first started formally training people and putting together sessions on analysis and design, mostly on curriculum architecture design, because that was so unique. And everybody else thought, OK, we, we know how to do design of a, of a learning experience or a course, so we don't need that. Um, and so I only had really formal uh, workshops for being the analyst or the curriculum architecture designer. But General Motors wanted it all. And they, I was in competition. I didn't know this initially, but I was in competition with some big heavy hitters in their subcontractor and their contractor communities. Raytheon, big deal. Um, General Physics, big deal. But anyway, so I beat them out and they were told that their people were going to have to learn guys' methodology when they had their own methodologies, but they liked mine better because it started off that performance orientation and part of the philosophy was, you know, we want to, as the fourth type of, you know, we do analysis on the target audience, on the performance and the gaps, on the enabling knowledge and skills, and then we look at existing content for its reuse potential either as is or after modification. And General Motors and the entire auto industry had just for a decade or so been going through the same process. Um, I remember in that second meeting, somebody was complaining about, you know, uh, you know, how you can't take content, existing content and use it as is and all that. And I said, so excuse me, but how many vehicles do you guys produce? Not the trucks and the buses and the locomotives for trains, but cars. How many of those? I think the number was 147 or 142. And I said, so do you have 142 different batteries that you put in those cars? Oh, no. I said, do you have 142 different radios that you put in those cars? Brake systems? Or, you know, you got the little the little Chevette and you got a little brake for that one. And for the Corvette, you got a big brake because that thing's going four times the speed of the other car and it's got a really... You know, and so they 
started thinking about that and I go, so you're reusing, and I know that your competitor Ford is doing this because, you know, part, all part of job number one is, you know, the quality in the first vehicle out. Um, you're reusing component parts across the entire platform, all your vehicles, and you're reducing your costs for creating that stuff, uh, warehousing it, using it, you know, and, and doing the warranty and maintenance kinds of things on that. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I learned a lot at Motorola about systems engineering, you know, a little enough to be dangerous, about systems engineering. And within a system, there are products. And within the, those products, there are components. And this component is different. You know, we could put in the, the good, better, best, or the one that goes faster, or, you know, uh, deals with the heat better, or the situations in that. So we could put in some different component. So I thought of things in the hierarchy the bill of materials that says, here's your swing set, here's the metal bars, here's the chain, here's the seats, here's the screws, here's the nuts. And so I thought of instruction, uh, and this is why I think it, it parallels, you know, computer-aided design, because that's what computer-aided design tools do. They take standard parts from the standard parts inventory. You, the engineer, the designing engineer, want a different part here? No. At Motorola, when I was uh, supporting purchasing, when they were going through this, I attended a conference of the global purchasing managers and the head guy from the purchasing world at, at headquarters got up and on the stage in front of everybody, you know, hundreds of people in the room. And he said, this is very dramatic. I, I really love this guy. Um, he was very dramatic. He says, uh, Toyota, after the war, decided they couldn't afford much. And as they started rebuilding their company after World War II, they used seven fasteners to assemble cars. Bolts, clips, screws, seven of them. If you wanted to have the eighth one, you had to get the CEO's approval. So that never happened. And here we are, you know, a couple decades later, several decades later. And uh, so he then he says to the audience, Guess how many General uh, Fasteners General Motors uses to assemble their cars? Dramatic pause, pregnant pause. He says, 17,000. He walks over to the side of the stage where he had placed a cup of coffee. He got the cup of coffee up. He took a drink of it. He put it back down. He walked to the center room and he asked the room, who has the competitive advantage? They all went nuts. And he said, well, you know, we're in, we're implementing, we've implemented MRP, uh, manufacturing requirements planning, uh, materials requirements planning. Then we're implementing MRP2, materials requirements planning. So beyond uh, uh, manufacturing requirements planning, so everything manufacturing needs, the oil for the machinery that punches things out versus just the materials. So this notion of using computers to manage your inventory of things uh, individual piece parts, components, sub-assemblies, products, systems, all thinking of it like that. And so I saw that there and I thought, that's what instruction should be doing because there's a lot of jobs that have to know the very same thing. They have to have the knowledge, they may apply the knowledge differently, or they may apply the knowledge exactly the same. When I was a salesperson in college, I had to run the cash register. So I had to know the cash register, the, the cashier's job, as well as my own job, because when they went on break, I had to cover for them. So they didn't sell, except when their sales floor was so busy that they were sometimes asked things and they had to know a little bit about what we salespeople did. And so that was that cross training. And so that's how I was thinking about all of this. And so I was, you know, so I was, you know, not happy to be at General Motors the second time to do the same presentation. You know, I had to go, go from Chicago to Detroit on my own nickel. You know, they weren't paying for this because it was a sales opportunity. And, you know, I decided, you know, enough of this nonsense. Um, you know, one, I never wanted to, we had a policy in my, in my company <laughs> Uh, by the by the owner the original owner and I was a partner by this time and we never chased any of their business because they were notorious for you know saying oh we got your invoice we're cutting seven percent out of it and here you go here's your money um and we never wanted to be under their thumb so 
we didn't want to become too dependent on them. So I'm there in that meeting and there I'm getting pushback from some people, but they, my client, they, from the training organization, if you will, they had invited in some of their key clients, their stakeholders. And those stakeholders were basically either finance people or engineers. And they heard me talking and, and defending some of the critiques that I was giving and, exp you know, explaining it, defending it. Why would you do that? You know, they could see what I was talking about. They got it. And they, that's how I got this five-year contract to train hundreds of people at General Motors, uh, staff members, and their subcontractors in this methodology. And I had had experience training people fairly informally at Hewlett-Packard as one example, um, and formally at Eli Lilly and at Amico. And I, so I had in my mind, okay, this five-stage process is, you know, what we should use. So the first thing is you got to figure out, so what's the body count? When we're all done and the dust is settled, you know, how many people do you want trained? And how many of those are generalists and how many of those are specialists? How quickly do you want to see this accomplish? Are we going to bring in people from all parts of the business or just at headquarters and that training staff? Mm -hmm. So I kind of force them to think that through because there's huge implications of how you implement something and try to take it company wide, especially if you're the world's largest manufacturing company. I mean, it's a big deal. And, and we're just talking about North America now and not the operations, you know, in Europe, if we're, as an example, or in Australia. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, this takes my micro thinking on instructional design is that I believe in giving people information and then a demonstration of what that looks like when you apply that information. And now application exercise where you're going to do it more than once, you know, more than one and done. And so my concept was, we'll start off at the top, at the architectural level. You don't have to, but that's where we should start. Um, and we would do some demonstration projects on curriculum architecture where me and my staff would do those projects. The people that were to be trained would be briefed beforehand. This is what you're going to see. Write it down, write it down. And when you're in there observing me doing this, Pretend you're in the cry room where you can scream and yell, but nobody can hear you because we don't want to hear you interrupting and asking questions and challenging us while we're doing this, because that's always, always happened, especially with people with PhDs. Because um, this is not how Gagne's, you know, uh, events work out. I mean, this is different, you know, that, you know, so they felt a need to challenge what they had learned in their programs uh, versus what they were seeing Guy and company doing. So if I if they observed a curriculum architecture design and saw it to the end and couldn't push back, couldn't challenge things, if you had challenges or questions, write them down. We'll debrief when we're done. But what they would see is that uh, they didn't like this part here. But then, but through the course of the meeting, they thought, "Oh, it all actually worked out." Huh? Who would have thought? And so, doing those demo projects was critical. And then I would put them in formal training, the workshops that I had. And we, we used the workshops that I already had, and we built out some new ones. And so stage one is figuring out, you know, what's the end game? What's the goal? What's the body count? You know, generalists and specialists and all that. And where are we going to go? And where are we going to go in the second wave and a third wave and all of that? So that there was some logic to the whole thing. And you needed to prepare people mentally for this is the plan. This is how we're going to do this. No, we're not jumping over here and over there, you know, just because somebody starts going, I like that. I want it. Well, wait your turn. Um, Cause there was always some of that. So we did the demos of the curriculum architecture design, and then we put the people through the workshops. So that was that stages one, two, and four stages three and five were at the, what we nowadays call, uh, learning experiences and in, in the old days they were courses and resources because part of this has always been build out a resource first give them a job aid oh if they've got to have it memorized and on demand in the performance context then yeah we'll train them so that they're at the ready but otherwise they say well hold on a second let me look that up and then perform so i always wanted to default to the 
job aid or performance guides before we created, you know, instruction, learn, because that's a one form of instruction and courses are another form and learning experiences, same thing. So we would do the same thing at that modular curriculum development or instructional development level. And I'd do the same thing. I'd brief people, have them observe in the quiet room, in the cry room, what they saw, writing down their questions so I could answer those in a debriefing, and then they would go to training. So part of the training thing then, the, the last two uh, ends of the stem, if you will, uh, where you'd been formally trained, well, then I had a certification process that said, um, you know, when you were a level three, you could go solo. So one, you've been trained. That's a level one certification. Two, you've successfully co-facilitated these meetings with somebody who was also a three or better. And so the goal is to get everybody to be a three where they can go solo. Um, and when you're new doing something like that, it's always good to have somebody you know there with you, co-doing it with you, so they could say, uh, "Guy, you forgot something," you know, and gently remind me <clears throat> without publicly humiliating me um, that you know, guy had forgotten a step or something, or he explained something in a clunky manner and he didn't read the room and look at the faces and go, "They didn't get that." So that was the role of the other person. And my new staff, that's how I did it too with them. I co-did it with them until I thought they could go solo. Sometimes I buddied them up. Sometimes they truly went solo. And so that was all part of, you know, getting people the initial competence as we judged because our competence was didn't involve any knowledge tests because, <laughs> you know, I really don't believe in knowledge tests and quizzes. Um, I want to see, can you, you know, I can tell that you know it if you can do it, if you can apply it, because that's really what's important, because you can pass a knowledge test and still not be able to do it. And so that's all the lot behind the philosophy of performance-based instruction is, can you perform? That's the acid test. Can you do it in this situation, which is safe and easy peasy, or you can do it in this hellacious effort where the clients are screaming and throwing things around the room. Mm -hmm. And so you got to be able to, you know, do that, but, you know, we have to incrementally get people there. So part of this was for, for General Motors was the certification where my company, attested to after observing either the outputs produced mm -hmm. and or the performance that they exhibited in these various meetings and such. But not everything is a meeting, but there's so many meetings that that's really key and core. And so one of the selection criteria for my client when we were back in stage one talking about, so how many bodies do you want? Okay, because mm -hmm. they asked me in this was kind of a joke, but it's generally true, but not always true. If you give me PhDs to train, they're going to struggle with this. They're going to resist this. They're going to fight it because this ain't what they learned back in school. Mm -hmm. um, if you give me master people with master's degrees, yeah, I can, you know, they can go either way. You give me people who've never been a training person at all, never developed or delivered anything other than presentations and such. Give me really sharp people and we can get them to a level of competency quicker than all the rest. And so the client had people that were in all of those levels of educational experience, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so they learned that that was true. Um, but I remember one person saying, you know, this is not Gagne. Where is that? And somebody else in the room saying, well, let me explain it to you. And he got up to the flip chart easel and he went, here's Gagne's events of learning and, and here's what Guy's doing and here's the parallels to them, okay? He's just using different language and it's configured slightly differently, but it's there. <laughs> and everybody went, oh, ah, okay. So I was thank most thankful for somebody who was more formally educated than I because I know about Gagne, but I can't tell you what, what, what the number of events are, uh, uh, et cetera. I can't because I didn't learn that. I learned... Some, I learned from Rumler and others like him about doing performance analysis. And I learned from Tom Gilbert how to do, how to think about knowledge analysis. And then I changed those kinds of things. The thing that's probably the most pure in my methodology is what I learned from Rumler about performance analysis, 
But when I reviewed it with him, what I do, how I do, what I produce, it was different from his stuff. And he he was, but he was able to look at that and go, okay, yeah, that would work too. It's not how he did it. Because what I learned so many years earlier was a derivative of a derivative of his methodologies. Because the people I learned it from had learned it from others who had learned from Rumler directly. And so, you know, that's how that goes. Um so that's a very long answer to how to get started on this thing. But, you know, it's basic blocking and tackling. Um, you got to figure out your game plan. You got to figure out, you know, what does the end state look like? Who do I have that's trained to do what? And then where is there, are there starting points? Um, you know, and this whole notion of creating specialists versus generalists is really key and critical. Um one of the things I told General Motors and other clients uh, back in the 90s and 2000s is that um, it's it's harder to um, take somebody who's well entrenched in something and teach them a process that's quite different from what they're used to. But one of the things that I've learned is that the people who have these more formal education approaches and have experience, they're all different. They're all varied. You can't generalize and say, you know, here's the a persona for that, you know, person, because there's no such thing. There's a multitude of those. Um, but, but figuring out that end state and that goal and how to get there. Um, so there's, there's not one easy answer to that. Now I'll shut up and see, entertain your questions no this is great and i want to dig in a little bit more about what some of these pieces might look like um let let's start with that certification process of someone who we're focusing on the later stages of design and development so they might be now getting certified in being able to you know build out lesson maps or you know the the in individual instructional activities or maybe the maybe the module level a little bit um it's re I, I think a lot of folks probably could use some of the resources that you have already and figure out what some of the big mistakes would be, right? If you're not, you know, capturing the right outputs, um, if you're, you know, if you're in one of the facilitated design sessions with your, um, you know, master performers and you're not doing a good job of capturing things on, you know, board or flip chart or something, there, there's, there's the obvious stuff. There's probably some more subtle things that you've seen with your experience that, like, you're making it through the process, but it's not quite at the level where we're ready to say you're ready to fly solo. What's some of the stuff that you might look for that would make that bridge to like, oh, you're close, but we really do need to fix these things before we're ready to give you the full stamp of approval? So I think that, you know, since uh, my methodology kind of centers on using a facilitated group process, but as I like to say, it's really all about the data. So I can do produce the same data. Uh, the, the mechanics of getting to the same data are different. If a facilitated group process run a three-day meeting, put it on flip charts or whatever, and type it up, word process it, versus conducting individual interviews, observations, and doing document reviews, the traditional methods for doing it, analysis. And, you know, but you do the interviews and you talk to person A and then B and C, and they've all told you something different and they don't jive. They don't come together. They're overlapping and gapped and, and contradictory. Mm -hmm. And you don't know if that's really the language because one person says the and the other one says the. And is that the same or is that different? It looks kind of the same, but it sounds different. And, and so having people being open to that, being open to things being rather ambiguous um, to start with, knowing that if they trust the process, this is one of the things we used to hammer, trust the process, trust, trust my process because I know it works. And eventually it'll all work out. Um, people are sometimes afraid, whether it's individuals and then reviews with clients or whether you're running a group meeting with the client group or with a team of uh, for the analysis purposes or the design, is that people that you're facilitating or dealing with, they don't always agree. 
and they have different mental models and they have different language and they've configured stuff differently in their heads and your job as an analyst is to get in there and deal with all of that successfully and it takes really good active listening skills really good verbal communication skills um and and a bunch of other things you know having you know business acumen um because that's really what it's all about but but being aware that people are going to disagree. And I don't know where I where I got this phrase from. It wasn't mine, but heated agreements. I've seen so many heated agreements where people will argue and scream at each other because they are master performers from different parts of the organization and they are known for being damn good at what they do. And they know they're damn good. And so they've got big egos. And so they get into these verbal exchanges that get quite heated. And then at some point, somebody, one of them says, kind of, you know, so do you mean X and Y? And the other person goes, of course I mean X and Y. And they go, oh, they turn to me and they go, never mind. We're good. And, and so I learned early on that that was likely to be happening. And so I would learn to anticipate it. And then I got even smarter and started telling the group, this is what's going to happen. No kidding. I betcha. When it happens, you know, I'm going to go put a star on that board over there for me because I <laughs> predicted it. And, and so I, I want you all to be more aware of that. And that when somebody says, guy, you stupid fool, what they're really trying to convey is, guy, I'm not sure I understand what you're trying to say. Can you please help me with that? And they would laugh because there are people with big egos. They're really good at what they do. They've been involved in those kinds of exchanges where they were, it turned out to be a heated agreement. And so they, so they would laugh about this and I made it okay for them to challenge each other, but do it in a, in a more conducive way to getting cooperation and acceptance. Oh, let me try to explain that again to you, you fool. No, they would say, oh, Bob, you know, let me, uh, let me try that again. Sorry, it's my fault. And you'd see their personalities change from being kind of gruff and driven to being more open to listening and asking more uh, probing, intelligent questions. Like when you guys say the you know, maybe on the East Coast, we call it the, and you on the West Coast call it the. Is that the same kind of, here, let me explain what I'm thinking. And they go, oh, yeah. And I had clients who would be sitting in the back of the room thinking, ah, we're wasting a lot of time here, guy. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And guy would have seen and heard and sensed that there was this kind of a thing going on where our communications and my client wanted me just rush right through it put it on the board and get on to the next thing here guy you're wasting my time and but it wasn't like that and so not only did i have clients like that but i had practitioners that i trained and developed mm -hmm. who also were impatient now there's nobody more impatient than me <laughs> but if i want to be successful if my ego demands that i be successful with this endeavor then i'm going to have to pull back and allow things to play out and give time and space for arguments to determine whether or not there's truly two different ways to do this and they are they don't sound alike or look alike or but there are two paths to that end point and then it became a question of um how what should we teach the person initially and then we teach them under these different uh, conditions in your performance context, you might want to try plan B because maybe that's the right thing, but we're going to start with plan A. So which one would be A and which one would be, and is there a C? Three different ways to get to the end point, but generally you would need A most of the time unless you're in some cer special circumstances, like you're in California and it's different. Okay, then B is for the Californians and everything else would start with A, B, and C. But Californians start off with B every time because of, you know, the local regulatory environment or whatever. Whatever the driver is for those variances and do those variances, are they universal variances? Like, you know, everywhere it gets hot and, and sticky and that stuff. And sometimes it rains and in some places it snows and sleets. And when you're performing, you're doing things different.
get down, they don't necessarily want to let that kind of play out. For them to say, what I heard this person saying, what I heard that saying, and let me try to summarize it and write it down, you know, that's risky because now I'm, I can get it totally wrong and embarrass myself in front of a group of people. And so my ego has got to be strong enough that I'm willing to do that. I would tell people and try to model this for, for the people that I was developing. I'm going to ask a question. The first person to give me an answer, I'm going to turn right to the flip chart. He's I'm going to write it down and then I'm going to turn back to you guys and look at and do face polling and look into your eyes and on your faces to see if you agree. And you can help me out if you'll do this when you agree. And if you don't agree, you do this. And then if you're not sure, do it diagonally here. And, you know, everybody would laugh and we'd loosen up and we'd, you know, know that, okay, guy won't always get it right, but he'll, he's going to do what he said. He's going to listen. He's going to take the first thing he hears, write it down and see if everybody agrees with that or not. And if we don't agree with it and the consensus shifts, you're going to see him take that flip chart easel, which is pretty with columns and all this other stuff. It looks pretty. And he's going to exit out and make a mess out of the thing. And it's a living, breathing flip chart set of data. And we're, and I said, I'm looking for the consensus. And if there's truly not a consensus, we're going to capture both. And I'm going to take it to my client and let them decide because, you know, who the heck am I? To, I can't decide. I don't do that job for a living. I can't judge what's the right and wrong and all of that. That's up to you. That's why you guys are here today. Um, but And people, analysts struggle with dealing with those kinds of sometimes controversy and 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 conflict in a group forum and their job is to get it worked out they don't have to have the answer they just got to get an answer that the group can feels acceptable and when there ain't no one answer there's two or three answers and you got to get all three of them and we'll decide later in design which one do we teach first second and third that's not for today's decision. But the people in the room don't know that. And they don't trust us because we're from training and they've seen the garbage that we've produced before after they've invested all this time and energy in us and they see what comes out of it. And they, you know, they're embarrassed. Um, and, and so it's dealing with the people element that I think is the hardest thing for people. You've got to find, you know, if you want somebody who's, who's truly an introvert and can't get extra, I'm an introvert. But when I do those meetings, I got to be an extrovert. I can't help it. I just got to. My ego demands that I, you know, come outside of myself and go do that. But if I wanted to be truly an introvert, I got to I got to work on a development tool, creating content here, and you know, then I have to review it with people, and uh, I hate that. But but so we can find places for the square pegs and the round pegs in the in the various holes in our process, and plug the people, right people in the place. And so that was really critical. So up front in stage one, we're talking about those kinds of things, the selection of people for generalist or specialist roles. You may have thought you wanted to create everybody to be a generalist. You know, the, uh, one of my clients at AT&T, he was, I guess, from Texas. He talked about Texas Rangers, you know, one riot, one ranger. You got a town exploding. You send one person in there on a horseback and they'll clean it all up and come back and everything's good. So, but we can't find enough people uh, that can be generalists that can swing both plate, you know, bat from the right and bat from the left. God didn't create everybody to be a switch hitter. They either bat from the right or they bat from the left. Some people can do both. And so that's care that careful selection of people. Once we understand what is our end goal, what would we like? And then we got to get real about what can we actually put in place? Do we have the people to become generalists? Um, that can do the whole project on their own, fly solo on the project from the beginning to the end, and they're done. And, you know, we can give them some help, but basically the load is on them. And so the, the, this is this is tough for, in my experience, for my clients who had to give this, cons this con uh, you know, consideration as to what do they want and can they make that happen? Do they have the people actually to make that happen? And so most of the time it was, we can start developing people to become, we can take your developers because that's what they're already doing. And we can teach them how to do this design stuff and take them through guys process of getting them to be analysts and then project planners and managers. 
and we can take some of the designers at the course level and create architectural designers because that's kind of the same but also different and can we take people whose minds kind of work that way where it's an easy segue from what they do and how they think about things into that next role um, or are we struggling to pound that round peg into the square hole and there's splinters everywhere and that's not good for people that's not good for the business um and maybe we need to let them be the designer at the lower level before they step up to be the designer at the higher level once they've built more confidence in themselves so i've had clients where that's happened where all of a sudden people who didn't want any part of some of these things wanted it they saw that was they'd figured it out they they'd gotten their minds wrapped around it successfully um so again another long answer to your question but but I think the ability to facilitate groups of people to have those good verbal communication skills and written communication skills, uh, to be a good active listener, um, to be okay with, you know, to have ambiguity tolerance, those are key and critical uh, earmarks of people who can be successful. Now, and but there's always exceptions. There's people who my clients or I would have said, "Yeah, that ain't for them." But it was, but we were wrong. <laughs> and so to be open to the fact that we bring in all these people who don't even know themselves, they think they're an introvert. I had I had a person that I trained once in a project product management role, and we were teaching them how to facilitate product team meetings with people from all different corners of the organization coming in and working on this product plan. And they thought they couldn't do it. But when they got into the exercises and they were running the meetings and all this stuff, they found out that they were actually superior to others in the room who thought they were really good and who were good, but not excellent. And and so I think that, you know, we don't know, we don't have, we don't have the time and energy and f financial resources to really test out everything about people. Because, you know, people are strange that way. They can surprise us. They'll tell us one thing and do another. Um, and so I think that, you know, being flexible as you implement your plan, because you thought you were going to take Guy and you were going to make him a generalist, but he stopped after design. Because my experience, I would tell Warren clients, some of my best analysts are lousy designers. Some of them will admit to it. Others will resist that. Like, oh, no, I'm a good designer. No, no, you're not. You're a good analyst, but you're not a good designer. And some of my, and vice versa. So, so we have to be willing to have a plan and a goal and work our way through that, but assess ourselves and, and the people that we're putting through this and making some changes as we implement and be ready for the fact that, you know, that people who we didn't think could go any further, they didn't think they could go any further, all of a sudden want to chomp it at the bit. And maybe we can, maybe we can't. Because we don't need everybody to be an analyst. We don't. You know, we need more developers and we need designers and we need less analysts because if the analyst was truly a specialist, they would do analysis on, you know, all 100 projects or you'd have five of them and everybody does 20 in a year. Um, but how many developers we need? So there's a, you know, so there's an overkill in terms of developing people. And if they don't use it, they're going to lose it. We put it in cold storage and we go to get it later on and it's no good anymore. And so we've got to really think about, you know, what volume of work are we going to be uh, attacking and how might that change? And of course, every number that you put down is wrong, but in the aggregate, we're hoping we're pretty close. But how do we build those things out? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about the non-overlapping pieces of that Venn diagram. So if you've got an analyst or a designer or a developer, there's going to be some skills that you're going to need regardless of which role it is. When you're thinking about, hey, this person's really doing well as an analyst, but they may not have the chops for the designer pieces of it or vice versa. What what are some of the things that you think really are unique to each of those roles that you should be looking for for someone to excel in them? Uh, this is tough, and I don't know that I have a good answer, but I'll, but I'll try. So I think analysts need to be more concrete thinkers. They also need to be able to kind of think conceptually and abstractly, but they need to 
be concrete. Designers take concrete data then and imagine something, you know, that's different that would be effective given the requirements and constraints of the client in terms of, you know, how we would design something to be developed and then deployed. Um, and I think many people have both of those things, but some people don't, you know, they don't, they're, they, they think concretely and not abstractly. And, and the role of a designer is to be somewhat creative in creating, you know, how do I make a meaningful application exercise and provide feedback? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sometimes we need lots of feedback because there's lots of aspects to the performance. And sometimes it's rather clear, you know, there's two or three things that we need to give feedback on rather than 12. Mm -hmm. So how do you design an experience so that that feedback component is really critical? And the people who have to think through those kinds of things and, and think through that out loud in a group forum to see what other people think about it and get their ideas and incorporate that all in there, that's that's kind of different than than pinning down the current state versus creating some future thing. Um, so I, the the interpersonal skills, the intellectual skills, the psychological skills, uh, skills or attributes you know are varied and i don't and i've never been comfortable with that i can pin that down um because i think i've seen enough examples where what i thought was required and what i thought somebody had or didn't have didn't turn out to be true sometimes it was true but you know i think i've seen often enough so i'm, I'm wary about trying to pin that down you know i can't <clears throat> You know, I can't do a uh, the uh, big five or ocean, you know, uh, conscientiousness. Of course, we need people to be conscientious. We need people who are intelligent. But what are the other aspects that they might bring into this that would make them successful? I'm, I'm, I was more willing to say, let's give it a go and try and develop people. And if they wash out, they wash out. And it may be that they only wash out temporarily and then they come back demanding to have a second go at it and then they're successful. Or they've decided that that's just not for them. That's not their cup of tea. That's not what they want to be doing. Um, so I, I don't know. That's that, that's tough. So if you were to look at your uh, existing staff and deciding, you know, one, I think if you explain, you know, what are these roles, these hats that you would wear? They're not job titles or they are job titles. Um, and this is what you do. So one of the things that I have on my website, so I have the Lean ISD book. I have 55 videos that align to aspects of the methodology. Here's how you do a target audience analysis. Here's how you do the performance areas of performance. Here's how you do the performance model charts with the outputs and the tasks and the gap analysis and all that. So I've got that all broken down and I've got all these videos uh, that align to that. And then I've got pages on my, a couple of websites that say, if you want to be an analyst, you know, here's what an analyst does for a living, you know, and, and here's what their knowledge and skills are. And here's a bunch of resources. And I've got uh, uh, audio podcasts and I've got articles and other videos and presentations and PowerPoint shows and blog posts and I've got, you know, way too many uh, of those. So I've narrowed it down and said, here's just a few to start with. And then once you've gone from being a beginner to some advanced level, here's some more that a guy thought might be, you know, appropriate for you to go and wade into and see what you think um, and take what you can from that and, and try to incorporate, incorporate that into your practice. Um, so I've got that for all five of the roles. So I've got, you know, here's chapters that you should read and, you know, the order, you know, and of course, if you're a generalist, then it's, you know, you got to do them all, but where do you start? Mm -hmm. So, so that's why my guidance is, you know, the being the lead developer may be the place to start. Most of my clients would say, I want people to start with project planning and management and then become an analyst and then become a designer and that become a, a developer and I would say, well, I do that. I've been doing that since the early eighties and I do it the opposite. You know, I'm going to grow people from the end of the process and grow them up to be at the front of the process and be competent with that. 
because I want them to deal with the, the next thing that I want them to learn. A developer looks at those designs and the levels of design and and then they build things out. So that's already been then demystified when they go to learn, how do I do that? Well, as a designer, you're taking analyst analysis data and then incorporating that into the design, but you already know what the design looks like here, but here's a new set of data. And so here's how the mechanical process for sorting and sequencing data into the design. And so that's the way I would do it. Otherwise, you're always asking people to produce things when they don't know what's the downstream step and who does what with it and what's really important to them downstream. Mm -hmm. And if I have this or don't have it, does that impact them? Mm -hmm. Well, you would know that if you swam upstream rather than swam downstream. So I think that's that's all part of it as well. Um, and you can take people who already, you know, and if you were, so if you would said, I want specialists and I need them to be analysts, I would want an analyst to have participated in a project from end to end. Mm -hmm. So they would see what's there. Uh, I would tell stories such as, you know, back in the, so I, I started doing this in 82 in a consulting firm at the, at, at the end of 82. And a decade later, I'd done a whole bunch of these things, but but I was dealing with two business partners who owned equally the one third of the company like I did. And they would do analysis and have me come into their client situation and run the design meeting. And every time I dealt with their analysis data, it was different. It was configured different. They didn't include certain things that I needed in order for my process. And so I, the sneaky trick, I developed a database, an access database of the fields, and the fields were unforgiving. Either you had data to go in them or you did not. And so they would put give their data and bring it in back to the office, and our word processing staff would put it in the database and then generate a report, and you'd see all the holes where they didn't have data. And I would tell them, okay, you told your client that this was going to be a two- or three-day meeting. You have to add another day to it because I've got to make up for what you didn't do in analysis. Oh, I can't do that. We've already problem. All right, then you just tell them that the design will be incomplete because I won't get done in time. Or I'm going to do it at a very shallow level. It won't go deep where it needs to. And therefore, what we hand off to the developers is not going to be very good. I'm sorry, but that's just the way that it works with data. You know, and they were, you know, one was a former Bell Labs engineer. and He, under, he knew I was right, but he felt like he could just wing it and generate a bunch of data and then hand it off. And somehow we... You know, it's like the editing. We'll we'll fix it in the editing room, you know, the video. Well, you know, we didn't shoot those scenes, but somehow we'll fix it later on. Well, with computer generated stuff now. Yeah, you probably could. But but so I uh, so getting that to happen correctly when you're dealing when you have a data driven process, you need to make sure that the data is complete and it's accurate and it's appropriate you know and you and when you're dealing with clients in the review my thing is always that it's got to be valid data and it's got to be credible because i've generated valid data with people who didn't have credibility with the ultimate client who threw the binder across the room when they got it back in 81 when we were putting everything in binders um because the names of the people that i used as my sources he did not trust, he did not like. And so everything that we did was just thrown away and I had to go do it all over again. And I learned a valuable lesson, you know, always have the client and stakeholders uh, handpick your sources, people, places to go observe things, places to stay away from, people not to talk to, you know, let's have a list of, here's the, here's the sources to use, here's the sources we don't want you to use, because I would always ask that. And of course, people are hesitant to saying, well, you know, I don't trust Guy Wallace, but I don't feel comfortable putting his name on your list. But but here I am pushing you to say, because otherwise I, they may, the people that you identify may point me to other people. Who is it you don't want me to talk to? I won't share that beyond the room, but mm -hmm. come on, keep me on the straight and narrow path here. Otherwise, I'm wasting your time and your money. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? And and so there's a there's a certain boldness that you have to have. I One of the things that General Motors that, I would tell the, the the people I was training, you know, trust the process. And I would say, when I'm running these meetings with the analysis team or the design team, I would tell them that they own the data, I own the process. 
I will dictate what we do now and next and next and next. They are responsible for the data being accurate, complete, and appropriate. Well, I had two young women who went into a meeting with a whole bunch of, you know, 20 year veteran engineers who were tough and gruff. And they said that, that, you know, you own the data, we own the process. And it blew up and they got skewered. And, you know, so that was a lesson for me. And I had to warn people, you have to be careful. You have to know your audience. You have to read the room. Can I say that? Or how do I say that? I have a process here. It's been proven to work. So we'll do this first and this second and this third. That may be different for how on, how you thought we should do it, what sequence. Um, but this is proven to work. And yeah, there's more than one way to do that. But so in order for us to have control and predictability about how long it's going to take to do this, let's do it my way. You own the data. I can't challenge it or whatever. I can look to see if there's a consensus amongst all of you about the data. But But that's really key and critical. So how you present that to a group can't be, I own the process and you own the data, you know, because that could come off rather poorly. Mm -hmm. And so their lesson, their experience was known throughout all the people we were training. Everybody had heard that story. And so they were a little bit, that made the next crop of people that we were developing a little bit wary about listening to Guy and repeating what he said, because that could get you into a world of trouble. We've talked a lot about the side of the instructional design and analysis team. I want to shift gears and think a little bit about having the client that's ready to go on this journey as well. And you know, in your context, that was often that you were an external, you know, provider. And so you had a you know particular sponsor within the organization. If someone's trying to take an internal department in this direction, they probably need to find some of their internal business champions that are saying, hey, it's worth it because of all these advantages that you talked about earlier, right? The reduced life cycle costs, right? Actually being able to move the needle on whatever the performance issue is, as opposed to just doing stuff and hoping that magic happens, all of those things. One of the things that stands out from what we've talked about so far is in that facilitated group process, there's a lot of skill around being able to manage expectations, read the room, kind of let folks know what's coming and can help them work through some of those typical reactions. If we apply that same skill set to the business partner side and say, I'm, I'm trying to find someone who's really going to be on board with this process and you know it, it, they may have some good questions along the way but they're not going to start saying all right but i want to see all of these great enthusiastic learner things because like that's what i've always heard we should do they're going to say well you know is this actually meeting the business need is it you know delivering the performance outcomes we expect those sorts of things what sort of questions or conversations might you try to have in order to feel out, is this someone who's really going to be on board with that journey and is going to be able to, to have our back as we're trying to move in this direction? Yeah, I talked about this a little bit uh, a couple of days ago with uh, Boise State uh, students of how you deal with clients that are somewhat resistant to this. And I said, you know, my experience is that when I come in and don't talk about training, learning stuff at all, none of the jargon, zero. And I talk about performance. Your people are on the payroll to produce outputs that are inputs downstream. Those customers downstream, they either like it or they don't. It's either conducive to their needs or you miss the boat. But you have regulators who have something to say about it too. And you have to make money for the shareholders. And of course, the community at large outside the gates of the plant or whatever, they have concerns too. So there's lots of stakeholders about your processes. But I take a process orientation um, and I'm looking at outputs. What are the, what's being produced? What's the output produced, the service rendered, whatever. And how do you know a good one from a bad one? And what then are the tasks that people have to perform in order to produce that output? And then we want to know what they've got to know in order to be able to do, in order to produce things of value. Now, other than the knowledge and skill portion of that, that ain't training talk. That ain't learning talk, right? And so I've gotten clients that go, yeah, we're, you know, and I said, and I always 
somehow get into the conversation. You know, everybody's got an education mindset because we've all been through the education system and somebody gives you a bunch of knowledge. They don't know what you're going to do with it in your real world work. And if you're a student in grade school, you know, all we know is that we're giving you math one so that you can be prepared for math two and three. And so everybody's got this educational mindset and training is different. You know, learning is the umbrella for education and training, in my view. Um, educational is knowledge. Training is knowledge applied successfully, repeatedly, <laughs> maybe at the Six Sigma level, maybe not quite, but but that's it. So wh so what I want are people who I would call master performers. And if you talk to other training people, you're asking for subject matter experts. Subject matter experts are expert in subject matter expert. Uh, they, we may need them from regulatory affairs, but I want master performers who are doing the job to a level of mastery because we want to train everyone to be just like them or get closer to just like them, right? And clients hear a business orientation, a process orientation. And for the most part, in most functions in a, in a modern enterprise, they think like that. Now, if it's sales, you know, my joke would be, if I'm training engineers, they get that stuff automatically. That That's their world. When I'm talking to marketing and salespeople, they're going, but where are the balloons and the cake with candles? You know, where's the fun? And I, you know, th that's been my biggest struggle is dealing with people from functions or entire companies where they're not, they don't have that process and performance orientation. So if I was in a company, I would look for those people who are by the numbers, by the processes. I'd go to the quality people, the manufacturing people, the merchandising people I'm not too sure about, um, the sales people I'm not too sure about. I mean, I can be successful with them, but I'm not sure that their mindset is performance, process. They're thinking knowledge and behaviors and skills and competencies, but but when those are looked at out of context, we think that that's sufficient because that's an educational mindset. I'll teach you all about active listening, but I didn't prepare you to be at the complaint window with customers who just spent $100,000 and they're mad because that's different than somebody who spent twelve ninety five dollars and they didn't like what they bought. That's a different level of complaint and a different situation to deal with. So what is the per learner? What are they going to do with this? They better be prepared for their authentic performance. And sometimes I tell this story about Neil Rackham, the author of Spin Selling, who I met in 81 at Motorola. And I was dealing with my manufacturing, man, manufacturing operations managers, moms or mothers. And they, they told me they were the belch, fart, and scratch crowd in Motorola. Not like all these other degreed engineers from Notre Dame and all these other places, you know, the foo-foo people. We are the meat, the meat and potatoes kind of guys. We are the ones who actually make things happen here. And I had Neil right in the room. And I'm talking to them about practice with exercise, how important that is, and we need to do more than one and done. This is not what they've ever seen from training and before, you know. We don't even do practice. We tell a couple of war stories and we're happy with that. And so I'm telling him this. And so Neil decides that I'm struggling. <laughs> and so he says, if I can have a word with you, well, now here's this British gentleman with a goatee in a three-piece plaid suit talking to these manufacturing, you know, sons of the, sons of the earth. Uh, um, and, and he says, so have you ever, uh, do you guys play golf or tennis? Everybody did. So he had them. He had the hook, the initial thing. He said, did, did, did you ever take a, a lesson from a coach? They all had. Because their egos demanded that they get better because that's they'd risen to the top of the manufacturing empire. They had to be good with about everything that they did. And so he, he knew this. So, yeah, they'd all had coaches. Did they ever change your grip? Well you know, there's eight or nine people in the room here and they go, yeah, yeah, they changed the grip. He goes, so what happened to your ball control? Oh, they were telling stories. Oh, the ball went this way. I hit a lady, you know. I, uh, you know, they just lost control. Tennis or golf, didn't matter. Change, they got the grip changed and they lost all ball control. So he said, so did you revert back to the old grip because you had some semblance of control? And they all got sheepish and they said, yeah. And he said, so the job of a coach 
is do not focus on the initial results, but to focus on the behavior. Because if you have the right grip, eventually, when you do gain ball control with that correct grip, you'll get even better. But if you revert, you'll always be limited. And that's the goal of a coach. And so when Guy talks about doing more than one round or practice with feedback, it's that feedback component of saying to Guy, the learner, Guy, you've shifted your grip. You've you've done some backsliding. Get Let's go back to the proper grip and ignore where the ball goes. Let's just get that grip and do the swing and keep that grip. Okay, good, 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 good. And all of a sudden, the results become reinforcing because maintaining the proper grip. And so he told this story. And so I, this is... This is dealing with the clients who are receptive, even if they don't know it. Mm -hmm. So how you enter into that conversation with them to build trust, to talk about performance, their performance, the more you know about it going in the door in terms of what's the current state, what do the numbers look like, where are they, where are they having issues without pinning blame, just being matter of fact about this and say, well, this is kind of what I would be thinking. I'd be focused on that particular production line and looking at what's being produced and what's good or not good about what's being produced and then swim upstream in the process and look and see what steps in the process are causing this and even be open to the fact that it could be a previous process in another building by a supplier that's giving us garbage in so we get garbage out and we don't know it because we don't know until we're done whether it was garbage or not. And if you can find some way to talk to them in kind of their language, um, I think it would get more reception. But you got to look for those people to start with. Um, I, I did a project with Illinois Bell Back in 1990, this is where I created the lesson mapping process because I'd done curriculum architecture designs and they liked that group process. Bring a group of people. Well, they had a labor relations course and the head of labor relations needed to update his course because it was out of date. They'd had new contracts that had been signed. And so the old thing is, you know, read the contract to the students. You know, the people out in the field hated it. And there was one high level manager who owned literally three quarters of the state of Illinois. Everybody at Illinois Bell that worked in that three quarters of the entire state reported to him. And he was going to be in this meeting because he didn't want to see that same kind of approach to training. He didn't like training. And my clients warned me about that. And I go, oh, th that's the perfect person because I know what they don't like about it because it's not performance relevant and never teaches you how to apply what you've learned. So I knew he was in the room. And he was gruff from the very beginning. But I started talking about, well, you know, I don't, I don't know. We don't have the data here, but I would say that I would put new supervisors, the target audience, into all the situations that have to do with labor relations. You know, guy shows up late to work. I got to give him a verbal warning. Then I got to give him a written warning. Then I've got to suspend him for a day with pay. Then I suspend him for two days without pay. And then I fire him after that. So there's a chain of events here that's that constitutes labor relations, which, you know, the contracts and labor relations govern that interaction with people. Um, it's not about when people are doing good. It's when they're not doing so good. And we're trying to deal with it and get them back on the right path. But I would put them through simulation exercises where, you know, and I started saying, I don't, I don't know the details of this, of your world here, but, you know, I can see where we have a role play exercise where, guy the new supervisor is dealing with the employee and across from them is the union stewards two of them and the union stewards don't take no gruff and they're there to protect the, their employee and they're you know and they're making the supervisor's job miserable but that's what the supervisors got to learn how to do they got to deal with that well, this guy all of a sudden loved this. Not only did he agree that, yeah, we should do this group analysis, bring the right people together, the best that we've got. I'm going to be in that room too. Can I be on the analysis team and design team when I'm on the project steering team? And I said, of course you can. And so he got in there and he was going to make sure that we you know, handled what he thought was important. So your worst enemy is sometimes your best ally because they, there's things that they are worried about and don't like. They don't want the standard same old, same old. They want something different. And 
when you're focused on real authentic performance, you know, and we take guy and we put him in an easy peasy situation, then we make it more difficult, then we make it darn difficult, then it's from hell. It's from Hades. He goes, yeah, that's exactly what you've got to do. And so I said, so we got to find a way to cover all the bases of the content, all the different situations the new supervisor could face them in and make it progressively more difficult. And he was all for that. And so when you're, when you aren't talking about, when you're only talking about training, but with that performance orientation, when you're always talking about that authentic tasks, situations that are difficult, not the easy peasy stuff, not a war story. I said the only time for a war story is when we when because my team is going to develop the content and we're going to deliver the pilot session co-deliver it with your instructors. But I've had enough times when instructors screwed up the what we built and did something different, like like the previous version, you know, that we were trying to displace. But but so we we would put everybody through that. And then let the chips fall where they may. And I talked about the pilot test. The first, and somebody would say, you know, ah, pilot test, I hate them. They're just an excuse to produce something crappy. I would go, well, we're trying to do a full destructive test in this pilot test to find out what's wrong so we can fix it before we release it to everybody else. And we had, you know, when you're dealing with performance, it, it, everything is much more predictable because you stripped out a lot of the arbitrariness. Uh, we're going to do something on this knowledge chunk here and what needs to be included and what not. All very arbitrary. What do we test him on? All very arbitrary. But if guy can perform, that's not arbitrary. Now, there may be variances, but that's not arbitrary. There's real world variances. Um, and the we we got to the point where we we're going to do the pilot test. We called the client up on a Thursday saying, are we ready for the pilot test on Monday? And they went, huh? You you guys are really ready to do this on Monday? I go, yeah, we are. We've got all the materials and everything like that. We're going to bring them over tomorrow and put them in your room so they're ready to go Monday morning early. And they go, oh, we didn't book a room. We didn't think you'd be done on time. So that even made us more credible with that client after that because we could get there on time. It was all much more predictable. And I think that that was one of the other issues here is that to me, it was always important that we were planful, that we did planning, that we hard schedule dates on the very first meeting. When are we going to be done with the analysis and do the review meeting? Okay, you guys are all available, not on that day, but not uh, but on this day. Okay, so then I have to be ready to bring you the now, which means that I'm going to need this much uh, lead time uh, between my analysis meeting and that. So we got, so here's the dates, the last day we can, we, three day meeting, it has to end by this date to give me that time to be ready. And so I could do the planning right in front of clients um, and negotiate with them about that. And they go, well, why do you need that much time? Because I've done this 27 times or a hundred times already. And I know what my, I know what my touch time is. I know what my cycle time is. I know what fudge factors I need to put in there so that I can hit the dates and, control my incurred costs so that I can give you a fixed fee price or a time and expense price if it's not quite predictable. But but so and not everybody is like that. A lot of people don't like planning because, you know, they're not in control. But when you have a project steering team and I'm doing this work for you guys. And so if you want to hit these dates here, then you own the resources. You can make it happen or not. If it doesn't happen on time, it's not on me. It's because you allowed some subject matter expert or mass performer to blow off a meeting. Then we live with the consequences. Then everything slides. And I and I may be able to recover or I may not be able to recover. Mm -hmm. um, being bold when you've got that client interface, it's different than being bold with an analysis team or design team. Um, the no nonsense no nonsense business people who don't necessarily like the training organization because of what they've produced and not produced in the past is different when you go up against them and you better have some business acumen you better think like a business person you better you know i, I would be asking so how do you keep score on all of this here what are the quality quality quantity cost metrics what do you what are the specifics here how do you measure performance where are you at now what's the baseline and those people knew 
But if I'm talking to other ex subject matter experts in a traditional thing, they don't know. But the executives whose bonuses are based on that, they know. So, but my world is different because I'm an external consultant brought in for, you know, things that are of high stakes. When you're working internally, you may not be working on that kind of level of stuff. You may be working on low st stake stuff. And then the question becomes, gee, if guy taught me all these ways how to handle this high stake stuff, but I find myself in a project of low stakes, what do I really insist on? What do I fight for? Is this the hill to die on or not? Do I just salute and go on and do, do it the way they're demanding I do it? And so I've confronted that myself. And I would tell people, well, my method is I would tell people, hey, I was spent three years in the United States Navy. I'm going to salute you and I'm going to go do what you say, even though I would never do it that way. But I'm going to do it. Get out of my way. Let me go do it for you now. And they'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because they're happy that I would go do their bidding as they saw it but they are concerned now because I'm saying that I certainly wouldn't ever do it that way or some words of that effect. And that takes a certain level of boldness to say, I'm going to salute you quite visibly. You can all see me doing it here in the room and I'm going to go do what you say exactly the way you say it. It's sometimes called malicious obedience. I might turn to somebody and say, this is called malicious obedience. I'm going to do exactly what they say, even though I know it's going to go in the ditch and it's going to be a wreck. And, and if they're open, they might say, well, what do you mean, you know? And uh, tell me more and prove me wrong. And, and then I would say why I was thinking the way I, I said, I don't know if I'm right, but I, this is what I'm thinking and what's the basis for that is. And this is what I would worry about because I'm on your side and I want to make this work and be effective and efficient, but effective first and then efficient and get people ready to perform back on the job competently. Now, the problem I see with what you're asking me to do is, you know, whatever it is, list it off and go, but I'll do it and we'll see. And we'll, we'll, we'll see what works and what doesn't work. Because, you know, you, you're, you know, you may be right. You're probably right. And they go, okay, let me think about this. All right, guy, we're going to let you, uh, uh, <laughs> what is the, what the expression here? Uh, hang you by your own rope. You will do it your way, guy. Yeah, we'll see how that works out. Now, so the pressure is then on me to do that. But I've invited that because I've done this enough times. You know, if I'm fresh out of the box, I don't necessarily have the competence and confidence. But I had that at some point early because I had great success in using Gary Romler's methods that focused on what's the output? How do you know a good one from a bad one? What's the process? Is there one? Uh, are people adhering to the process? If not, why not? And what's the consequence system that allows people to not adhere to the process? Because maybe that's the secret to everything. Um, and I and I learned that before I met him and heard him talk those words um, from the people that had learned from him uh, indirectly and sometimes directly. And and so the, you know when you're talking about bringing people in to do this kind of work, I'd start them off. I don't wouldn't pick the easiest thing. I'd pick something that's significant because, and that's what I would tell clients. I said, ah, no, let's not pick something safe. Let's pick something dangerous. And everybody knows that's dangerous. Why did those fools take that on? Because if we're successful, it's meaningful. If you're successful on some low-hanging fruit stuff, it doesn't mean a darn thing. You've proven nothing to anybody other than you were chicken to go tackle the hard stuff. So let's go tackle something that's hard and hairy. Okay, and either it's predictable or it's not. And we flex and we go for it incrementally or we have a plan and we adhere to the plan. So, but let's let's have it be significant in terms of its impact, significant in terms of the risks and rewards at stake. And we'll get some attention that way. We'll prove it in under fire. Um, and when if we do that, now, so do we have the team to go do that? How do we go do that? Are they ready to do that from the very start? Um, sometimes the answer is yes. I've had people that I trained, when I was training at uh, General Motors, there was a young woman who sat in at one of the tables 
And I, guys, pattern as he's very redundant as everybody who watches this knows. And I would say something, and I would say it again, and then I say it a third time, and then put people into the exercises. Uh, and she was reading a paperback novel at the table, and I thought, "Who is she to do this here?" I said it one time, and she picks up her book and she's back into reading it. And so I would say, uh, "Kim, her name." Kim, would you uh, go up and demonstrate this to everybody? And she'd get up and she'd just do it and be done and go back and sit down and get her book out. And I thought, whoa, she's good. She's sharp. She was one of these people who got it from the very beginning. She was a trained engineer. She was working for one of the big uh, subcontractors, General Motors, and she was just good. She had a stellar reputation. Um, she had never seen the approach that I was uh, sharing with them and teaching them before, but it all made sense to her because her head worked like that. And so she was able to go and do it. And she heard me the first time, got it, didn't need to hear it the second or third time. Other people did. Um, and and so when you look for, you know, which horse are you going to ride off to the riot with, you know, with two rangers instead of one, you know, who do you take with you to develop this, to prove it in? Um there's skeptics in the client side and on the supplier side. The people who are going to be trained may be fearful about, maybe I can't be successful doing this. Maybe I have some, some level of success in doing things the way we're currently do them. Why do I want to make this change? So you kind of have to prove it to both sides as you advance. So a demonstration project that I was using to develop people was you know and i'd say my client would say well you 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 can put 20 in one of your workshops and but i want to put in another 20 in them what can i do that and i go well they're in the cry room and either you have a cry room or you don't but if they're in my cry room they are to shut up and not say a thing they can take all the notes i can debrief with them afterwards here but i don't want them intervening into the class here because that destroys the whole thing um, and they may, and they're going to have valid questions because it's going to be different than what they know and what they've experienced. So we got to be open to all of that. Well, this conversation has gone in a ton of different directions, but it's been incredibly helpful. We've talked about the overall structure of trying to bring this methodology to an organization. We've talked about some of the skill sets needed, how we think about which team members might fit into some of those different roles. And then we've talked a little bit about the organizational side. So there's lots of insights here. I'm sure there's many more questions that we can go into. Um, I'm just going to close by reminding folks that you are incredibly generous with your knowledge, the resources that you have on your website, the interviews that you've done on YouTube. If folks that are watching this haven't had a chance to look at some of those resources, you really should because there's a wealth of knowledge and experience there. And it's absolutely incredible to, to see that, to see how you're sharing it, and then to be able to continue this conversation. So Guy, well, thanks that, so much but, for your time. But, but, anything but, but, you want to add? Yeah, but no, I want to ask you. So you came to me wondering about how to implement this, which I'm guessing you want to implement some version of this in your world. So do you feel that we've covered adequately what you need to think about as you venture into something like this, or you take people and develop them to do this work this, this way? I, I think so. Yeah. Some of the big questions I was thinking about going into this process um, was trying to think about how to sequence the development of some of these skills and maybe some of the traps to watch out for, especially if you know we have people who are maybe newer to the profession, which actually one of my takeaways from this is that that might actually be an asset that we can lean into because we don't have as many assumptions we need to, to break down. Uh, but then also thinking about what are some of those things that we need to look at beyond just, okay, the mechanics, can you create a performance model? Can you do a lesson map? Um, and the conversation that we had around uh, some of the facilitation skills, dealing with ambiguity, the active listening, managing the expectations of the group and helping them to understand what's going on and what their role is within that. Um, I think there's some really great advice in there that'll be very useful. Um, so I'm really excited about this conversation. So one of the things I will add is I post this video that we're doing 
um, would be links to those pages on my website. Here are the things that you can uh, read and videos to watch and audio podcasts and all of these things that that uh, you can first scan, get a sense for what's in there, and then decide where to deep dive and where not to. Um, my goal was to enable people who didn't have the resources to hire me to help them, for them to find their way there, um, a, a, to honor the many mentors that I had that all had this performance orientation. And I was able to learn from many and to boil it down uh, what, what did one of my clients say? That guy has reduced this to practice. And he's taken all the theories and concepts and models and tools and methods and all that stuff, and he's reduced it to practice step by step all the way through the process. Of course, it's not totally true that you could just use the process and never have to flex it because, you know, in the real world, I've as I've said, I, I have a process. It's, when I explain it to people, I explain it one way, but on every project not all every project, but most projects, I've had to flex and change it to fit the requirements and constraints of the situation that my client was in. And everybody else is gonna have to learn that too. But you got to start someplace, you got to learn some basic way of doing things, and then figure out how to flex, when to flex and how to flex as you go forward with this. So I'd be interested in hearing from you uh, as you think about this, because there's a lot to think about. As you go into that and look at those steps of the five stages and the resources that are available and think about generalists versus specialists um, and maybe start with a small group of people and take that. Fly side and the customer side, look at this and react and assess, is this worth it? Do we get the kind of impact that we want of performers performing with higher levels of competence much quicker? Because that should be the, the ultimate goal is to do that. Um, and if you find a champion on your customer side, um, you do like General Motors. I got a, a video that General Motors produced of people who had been through the audience in the video and my client at General Motors was going to share that um, with future clients. Yeah, you're going to hate this at first, but then you're going to love it. <laughs> Who says so? Other people outside the training organization, you know their names because they're big shots in the in the company. Um, and so you may do need to do something like that, get testimonials from the people that you work with about how they felt about it when they first heard about this and what they thought about it as they were going through it and at the end. And the question really that needs to be answered, is it worth all the rigmarole? You know, and that's a business assessment that needs to be made. Is it worth all the rigmarole? Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for the time today and the conversation. And uh, thanks so much for just all the work that you've done in helping to share this mindset with the profession and keeping moving things in a direction where we're really able to be good partners to the business and really helping to accelerate those results that ultimately make us all successful and, and end up having an impact in the world. So thank you. You're welcome.